Um, let's okay. see who else is here. <clears throat> okay, we're going to so, start. I think we start this uh, second part of the morning session in Niger War. Uh, like, you, you took any pictures, uh, Tife? Anyone took the uh, screenshot? The second page is it's, uh, people haven't enabled the video or they already muted it. Okay, let's just uh, quickly take, but you took a, a few pictures, right? Just the first page. Yes, I also did the first page. The first page. We, we just quickly. have 25 people. Let's quickly take a picture of the, of, the, of the pages quickly. Just take a screenshot. Second page. David Jenkins, we can't see you. Uh, David, okay, come we, see. we need everybody to turn on your camera for a second. A group, meet, group photo. Please, quickly. Group photo. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, more. So we have a page and a half. I see. I see Nara Singh and Kasha is also there. Kasha, how are you? <laughs> All right, I think uh, I think we have you took pictures. Okay. Yeah, of, of the cameras. Right. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay, Nigel. Okay. I'm going to share screen. Share. And I'll be able to hear the comeback of Coulomb excitation. So, can you see that? Yes, perfect. Good. Okay, right. So, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for organizing this great conference. It's really nice to actually do some physics for a change with all these times of COVID. Uh, and I think it's been a lovely conference as well. And one thing I really struck me with this is that originally this series of conferences started off trying to bring knowledge to South Africa. But now we're seeing this week, Af South African uh, physics has come of age and is now giving physics back to the rest of the community. And we're seeing this now throughout the whole world, which is really great. So it's a great honor to talk about Coulomb excitation here. So hold on, that's, uh, is that not advancing? No, ah, now it's advancing. Oops, advancing too fast. Okay, so as Magda said yesterday, Coulomb excitation is something that uh, was started in the late 50s. Uh, and people were able to calculate reaction cross sections and they needed nuclear structure information for that. So of course the next step is obviously then to try and say, well, if you've got some experimental data, can you extract the nuclear structure from that? And of course the answer is yes. So, uh, whoops, going the wrong way. So uh, uh, when you have a projectile and a target uh, interacting, you obviously have the Coulomb term, which we know and love, which is all nice and precise. You also have this nuclear term um, which you kind of have to do empirically with some kind of parameterization, and that's going to contribute to some kind of systematic error. Um, but there's a limit to how close the nuclei can get, and this nuclear term, of course, is short range. So Doug Klein pointed out that, in fact, as long as the nuclear surfaces stay at least five femtometers apart, then this nuclear component is actually negligible. So then we talk about safe Coulomb excitation, we're just considering then the Coulomb part, which we know precisely. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so what about the trajectory? Well, we know that classically the trajectory is a hyperbola, uh, and it turns out that as long as the distance of closest approach is much greater than the Compton wavelength, then actually the perturbation to that trajectory is negligible. So we can use a semi-classical approach where, where we use a classical trajectory and then we use the quantum mechanical description of the electromagnetic interaction. So if you imagine now uh, some kind of trajectory, uh, here we have a uh, uh, particle going around and scattering through some scattering angle. If we say that uh, theta cm is the center of mass scattering angle, what we normally use is this dimensionless eccentricity parameter. Um, and then we have to say where we are on that trajectory. So we use this orbit parameter omega, which goes from minus infinity a long time before the interaction through zero at the distance of closest approach up to infinity. Uh, and that replaces time in this way. So those are two dimensionless parameters that we use. So we're gonna to have to integrate over omega the couple differential equations. This is the theory of Aldrin Winter. Uh, and you can see that we have these uh, uh, um, a terms, which are the population probabilities. And you can see on the left, we've got a differential and it's of the kth substate. And on the right, we've got the sum over all of the substates uh, with index n. Uh, and this then we have this q term here in green. 
And those are the dimensionless collision functions. And uh, that depends on the multipolarity lambda and the component of that mu. And that's a function of these two dimensionless uh, efficient, uh, eccentricity and uh, orbit parameter. Um, that's just a set of functions. We also have this coupling term in blue. Those couple the two states K and N with the multipolarity lambda and component mu. Uh, and uh, that's going to incorporate the energies of those states and also the spins is going to be a Vigna 3J symbol coming in there. The thing that's really important, though, is the term that's in magenta. That's where all the nuclear structure is. That's the electromagnetic matrix elements. So here, M corresponds to one of those E1, E2, E3, or M1, M2, whatever. Uh, those are those matrix elements, and that's where all of the nuclear structure is. And then we also have this adiabatic exponential term. And that kind of describes the probability of multiple excitation when we have uh, going from one state to another and then up further. So if we just take a simple level scheme, now this is taken from an experiment on Krypton 96 that we did about a decade ago. And this was with Rex older, so we had quite low beam energies. So we actually only excited the first excited state, this 554 kV state. And because we've just got a zero plus and a two plus there, uh, this means that uh, we can only have the lowest term is, the, is an E2 uh, multipolarity. And then we could in principle have E4 or, or M3, but in fact, those are negligible compared to the E2. So in fact, we're only going to consider E2 matrix elements, but we have to consider two of them. And the first one is this green one, the transitional matrix elements, uh, and that's related to the BE2. In fact, the BE2 is proportional to this matrix element squared. And then the other one is the red one, which uh, is related to the quadrupole uh, moment, and that's the diagonal matrix element. So you can either talk in terms of transitional and diagonal matrix element, or you can talk in terms of B2 and quadrupole moment, with the caveat that with the B2, you've already dropped the sign. And although the absolute signs don't matter, the relative signs do, because you can get interference. So, oh, why am I not advancing? Oh, better. Uh, so, We've considered the excitation, so that will give you then what the population of the magnetic substates are. What about the decay? Well, fortunately for us, uh, the uh, timescales are very different. The excitation takes place in a much faster timescale than the decay, so we can essentially separate them out. And what is important with Coulomb excitation is that we have matrix elements that describe the decay and we have matrix elements that describe the excitation, but they're actually, in both cases, it's the same set of electromagnetic matrix elements. So we're not introducing a new set of unknowns uh, for the decay. Uh, there's the same set of, as for the excitation. However, it's not necessarily the exact same matrix element. If you consider this case, for example, we've got a zero plus, two plus, and a three minus. And you can excite that three minus in two ways. You can either have an E2 excitation up to the 2 plus, and then you have then an E1 up to 3 minus, or you can have the direct E3 excitation from the ground state to the 3 minus. Now you might think, well, the E2 is going to dominate over the E3, but actually you have to also think that a single step is going to dominate over a two step. So actually these two are going to compete for the excitation. Not so for the decay. For the decay, we don't care whether it's single step or, or two step, and there the E1 will dominate. So this is something you have to be aware of. So what we can calculate, well, we can calculate gamma ray yields for a given projectile energy and scattering angle. That's what we call point yields. We can also calculate multiple mixing ratios, because if you know the E2 and the M1 matrix elements, you can calculate the delta. And if you know all the matrix elements that depopulate a, a state, you can calculate branching ratios and you can calculate level lifetimes. So what can we measure? Well, the obvious thing we can measure is particle gamma coincidences. The problem is, is that our particle detector though has to determine the angle and it's gonna subtend a finite solid angle. So we're going to have to integrate over the angular range subtended by the particle detector, unless we wanna put the detector out very far, which we would lose efficiency. So we're really gonna to have to integrate over that. Another thing we're going to have to integrate over, in my Krypton experiment there, the Krypton is the beam. So it's going to lose a lot of energy going through the target. So we have to integrate over that energy loss in the target. And at some facilities, you might have a very large beam spot. And that means that two different points in the beam spot are going to have different effective angles. So you also have to integrate over that as well. 
So the general rule is you have to integrate over the point yields over all the experimental conditions, uh, and that's going to give you the so-called integrated yields. And that's what you then can compare to experiments. So this is the setup that we use, and, and Peter Butler already referred to this yesterday, but he said, come and see my talks. I wasn't actually planning on talking so much about mini-ball, um, but I'll mention it here now, especially because it's also going to be relevant for the next talk. So this is the mini-ball target chamber on the left here, and the beam is coming from the bottom left to the top right. And you can see this target wheel here, and this is the target that's actually in the beam position. And then just a few centimeters downstream of that, you have this particle detector, which looks a bit like a compact disc, we call it a CD detector. It's a double-sided silicon strip detector. And on the front face, each of those quadrants has 16 rings. And that's what we use then to determine the scattering angle. Now for Coolex, that's all you actually need, but we have Doppler shifts as well, because these um, the nuclei that are emitting the gamma rays are moving quite fast. So we need to correct for the Doppler shift. So we need to know the angle between the particle and the gamma ray. So on the rear side of those quadrants, each quadrant has 24 uh, sectors as well, which we normally combine in pairs. And that gives us the position of the, of the particle. So we know what the scattering angle is. If you measure, it doesn't matter whether you measure the projectile or the target, because if you measure one, you can calculate where the other one went. So in some experiments, we see just the projectile, some we see just the target, others we see both. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter because you can always calculate that. So if we close the uh, lid of the target chamber and put the detectors in place, we get the picture on the right. So now the beam is going from left to right. And there we have our 24 encapsulated uh, germanium detectors uh, that are housed in these eight triple cryostats that Peter showed yesterday. Uh, and again, uh, it's not relevant for Coulomb excitation, but in order to correct the Doppler shift, these detectors are actually segmented so that you get a better position determination of the gamma ray, because we need the angle between the particle and the gamma ray uh, for the Doppler correction. But for the Coulomb excitation part, we only need the scattering angle. So then we just simply measure particle gamma coincidences between these uh, two detector systems. And then the question comes, well, how many data points do we have? Now well, we saw we just had one excited state so the only gamma ray we observe is this 554 from the projectile, that is, is this 554 kV line. So how do we then do it when we have two matrix elements to worry about? Well, actually, we get a particle gamma combination gives us a, a, a gamma ray yield for each scattering angle that we have. So we have 16 rings. So in principle, we have 16 particle gamma yields. So actually, we have 16 data points for two matrix elements. So we're overdetermined. Uh, in fact, we can actually just combine adjacent rings to improve statistics, uh, which is what we normally do, um, but still then it's an overdetermined system, so we have no problem there. So we can then vary the matrix elements, and each time then we calculate the theoretical integrated yields, and then we can calculate, uh, compare them then with the experiment with a chi-squared fit. And this is the point where if you know any lifetimes or branching ratios or multiple mixing ratios or if matrix elements have already been measured, that's the point where you can include those into the chi-squared. That wasn't the case for the Krypton experiment, but uh, uh, in general that is possible at this stage. So this is what you then get. This is taken from our paper. Michael Alves uh, was the first author there. Uh, he did all the analysis for this. And uh, on the x-axis you see then here we have the diagonal matrix element. On the y-axis, we have the transitional matrix element, and the color scheme indicates then the chi-squared, so blue being the minimum, and the red corresponds to one sigma. So we can just simply project that onto the two axes and essentially just read off uh, the matrix elements with their error bars. Except that's not what you should do, because you can see this ellipse is tilted. And that implies there's a strong correlation between the two matrix elements. So you can increase one and decrease the other, and it doesn't make much difference to the gamma ray yields. And this is important because if somebody comes along and measures a lifetime, so a lifetime uh, corresponds to a horizontal line on this plot. And so if you have its error bar as well, that gives you a horizontal band. And if someone later on, and I live in hope this will happen, actually measures this lifetime, uh, using this correlation, they can combine with the overlap between the horizontal band and our plot. Uh, you can then constrain the diagonal matrix element or the quadrupole moment. 
And if you only publish the error bars, of course, then you can't do that. So you should always, if there's a correlation, you should always publish it. This is taken from Michel Arba's paper. So you also need to normalize. So you can normalize in principle to the integrated beam intensity. That's one way of doing it. That was usually used uh, back in the early days when they were trying to uh, do it with target excitation. Um, the other way of doing it is normalized to a known matrix element. However, you can't really use the integrated beam currents at a radioactive beam facility. The, the beams are just too weak. And when you've got a beam of say a picoamp and you waggle the cable, it's about 10 times that. Uh, so it's very difficult to get an integrated beam current measured accurately. So we don't do that. What we do instead is we normalize to a known matrix element, but actually it doesn't have to be a matrix element in the same nucleus. It can be, and at higher Zolder, it's often the case that the, a low line matrix element has already been measured and then you want to normalize a high line one to it, and that's fine. But you can also normalize the target excitation because you excite both the projectile and the target simultaneously with Coulomb excitation. And if you know the matrix element in the target, that allows you to calculate then uh, uh, essentially how many beam particles there were. And that then can be used as normalization for the projectile excitation. So that leads you to the question of well, what's a good target to use for projectile excitation. So the first thing of course is that the higher the Z then the more you get multiple excitation. Now that then kind of depends on what your physics uh, goals are. If you're looking for a state that's going to be populated by multiple excitation then you want to go that way. Uh, but if you're not then you might want to avoid that. So that's a question of what target you choose. Um, and again uh, you may want to use different targets in order to get different pieces of information out of the nucleus. Also you need to be able to separate the kinematics of the projectile and the target. This was I think a question that came up yesterday after Peter Butler's talk, why not use a lead target? Uh, and of course the answer is if your projectile and target have similar kinematics and they overlap in the energy spectrum of the particle detector, uh, then you can't separate them. Uh, and that's a bit of a problem because if you think they have a very different, although they have the same lab angle, they have very different center of mass angles. Now you can simply just sum them up uh, but then of course you essentially lose a data point if you do that. So it's much better if you have a clean separation between projectile and target. And the same is true of the gamma rays. Again, you need to have a clean separation between the gamma rays of the uh, target excitation and the gamma rays of the projectile excitation. And remember these nuclei are moving, so we're not talking about the intrinsic resolution of the germanium detector, we're talking about a Do Doppler broadened uh, effect here. And then, of course, obviously, you need to know some matrix elements either in the nucleus of interest or in the target in order to be able to normalize. So you need to consider all of these different effects. I say the first one is a smooth trend that goes through the nuclear chart, uh, but the others depend on specific details of the uh, kinematics and on the, uh, the particular gamma ray spectra and the matrix elements that are known. So that's a little bit oversimplified. So, so far, all I've talked about uh, is the sort of the basic theory, but it's not the whole story. So, one thing is, of course, nuclear deorientation due to recoil and vacuum. We don't have nuclei. We have atoms, and that means that the electrons also play a role. We excite those electrons, and then they decay back down to their atomic ground state. And unfortunately, here, the timescales are similar. So, it's not like the case with excitation and decay where the timescales are completely different. Here the timescales are going to be similar and that means that we have to worry about this. And um, the changing magnetic field due to the electronic transitions is going to perturb the nucleus via the hyperfine interaction. We need to take that into account. The problem is what's the atomic ground state? Because you might know the charge state of the beam when it's incident on the target, but it's not going to stay like that as it goes through the target there's going to be charge exchange, which means essentially that the atomic ground state is going to change. So this means that we can only really handle this stochastically. Uh, and this is going to give us some sort of effect that's around sort of up to 10%. Uh, now, of course, we can handle it to some extent. So uh, we don't, that doesn't, it's not the whole 10% that contributes to our error, uh, but some of that will contribute to our systematic error. So a second effect that we have 
is the recoil distance correction. So uh, you imagine our nuclei that are going to emit the gamma ray are moving. So they're going to go over some kind of distance before the decay occurs. And the question then is how does that change the angles? Because it's, uh, it means that we know what the, the angle of the uh, particle is because we measured the particle. Um, but uh, the question then is how far along that trajectory does it go? Well, that depends on the lifetime, which of course is something that we're trying to determine via the matrix elements. So this means that when you're trying to do some kind of fit or something or scanning the matrix elements, you need to be very careful because if you have a transitional matrix element that gets very small in the fit or the scan, that's going to correspond to a lifetime that is very long and probably unphysically long. And it's going to lead to non-physical distances. So by that, I mean distances that are much greater than the few centimeters between the target and the detector. And we know if the uh, 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 gamma rays were emitted in flight or not, because we see that from the Doppler shifts. So if we see that the gamma rays are emitted in flight, we know it can't be the case uh, that uh, uh, the nuclei have traveled 10 centimeters, but the codes don't know that. So this is something where you have to be very careful when fitting or scanning these matrix elements. So the final effect I wanted to talk about, this is relevant as particularly for what's coming up this afternoon, uh, and that is the giant dipole resonance. So you've already heard that uh, 75 years ago, Migdal predicted its existence. Uh, and of course, uh, this is something you're going to hear a lot more about this afternoon. And so uh, this, is, this is an effect that I've put it at the end because it's uh, going on to the next topic rather than because it's less important, because it's actually quite important. Uh, and you get an E1 polarization of the nucleus. And if you do the mathematics of it, it turns out that the form of the perturbation on the Coulomb excitation is actually has the same mathematical form as the E2 uh, Coulomb excitation. So the way that we account for that is to have sort of a modification of the E2 collision function. However, that means that we have some parameter that we need to feed into the code. And the question is, where do we get that parameter from? And until recently, there wasn't an awful lot of data about this. And this is where I'm really glad to say the host lab has really done a lot of work on this. And you saw yesterday the talks of Nico and Sebo who were talking about the measuring the uh, E2, uh, E1 polarizability. And that's a, an important input here for the Coulomb excitation analysis, uh, because this is otherwise just something which is going to give a systematic error. And so it's really nice to see that uh, they've been doing this work and there's more work uh, in planned as well. So I think this will allow us in the future to reduce the errors that are coming from this particular effect. It's not the only effect, we have other things as well. Um, I haven't mentioned, for example, uh, the contribution to the from the nuclear term. Uh, the energies we were at with the krypton, that's not relevant, but when you go up to higher energies at higher Zolder, you need to start worrying about this. And uh, we actually did a second experiment uh, with Krypton 96 at a higher energy with higher Zolder. And uh, uh, that's being analyzed to uh, consider if we can get some nuclear structure data from that, not from the electromagnetic part, but from the nuclear part. And I haven't mentioned also uh, about higher multipolarities, uh, which generally are really fairly weak uh, in the contribution to that. But I'd like to then summarize a bit. So the great thing about Coolex is a really simple technique. You just sort of need a particle detector and a gamma ray detector. And you just need to measure these particle gamma coincidences. And in fact, Magda was showing us that you don't even always need a gamma detector. Um, back in the early days, it was done with excitation of the target nuclei. And that was very easy to perform with the early accelerators. And it became very popular as a result of that. It then lost popularity primarily because other techniques came on that could be done with uh, stable beams. And they were then you know, fusion evaporation reactions and things like that, uh, which of course were more interesting uh, because lots of the uh, stable nuclei had already been studied. But with the advent of radioactive beams a couple of decades ago, so uh, next year is the 20th anniversary of the first mini ball experiment at uh, Rex's older. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, you can do these experiments now with 
projectile excitation instead. And of course, what's really important is the cross sections are really large. So we, we, we see that with Peter Butler's experiment there, he had something like 2000 ions per second in uh, radi was it radon 226. And uh, yet he was still able to do physics with that. And that's something which is very difficult to do with any other kind of techniques. So this is why most of the experiments that were done at Rex's older with the uh, um, post-accelerated beam would, uh, were cool on excitation experiments. Now with the advent of high older, that's changing a bit. You saw in Gerda's presentation this morning that uh, the percentage of cool excitation has considerably reduced, but it's still the workhorse of the studies uh, at Rex at high older. Uh, and uh, it's also, I think, going to be that way for some time. Um, however, you should also be aware of the intrinsic sources of systematic error. Now, when somebody tells you, oh yes, we've measured uh, the B2 to uh, half a percent, um, that's not very likely to be the whole story. That's likely to be just a statistical error. And you also need to worry about systematic errors, which can be sort of up to about 5%. Now, hopefully the work that uh, Nico and Sebo are doing will actually enable us to reduce that somewhat. Um, but of course, that's not the only source of systematic error, as we saw. So we need to worry about that. And I would like to also um, tell you that the next talk is also on Coulomb excitation with mini ball. Kenzo came and uh, did an experiment with us at Isolde, like his was with high Isolde, uh, and he's going to talk about that straight after me. So I think that's where I will say thank you for listening and any questions. Are there any questions? I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything on the chat. Yeah, I've lost the chat. <laughs> I, I see the chat now. Yeah. But I don't see any questions. Beautiful talk. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful conference. <laughs> I hope I said that also. You have a really. Uh, uh, I had a question, John. Would it be yeah. possible to ask? Mm -hmm. Of course. Okay. The question is, uh, I mean, in pure Coulomb scattering experiments, of course, nuclear effects are a nuisance. However, nuclear effects could be used perhaps through, let's say, transfer Coulomb two-step uh, excitation processes. Would that be useful to extend the, you know, studies to slightly more either neutron-rich or uh, neutron-poorer nuclei? Uh, oh, I mean, it's certainly. I mean, the the, uh, the Coulomb excitation uh, is not the whole story, of course. And with this uh, Krypton experiment, uh, one of the goals of the uh, uh, high as older Krypton experiment, so the more recent one, which is being analysed, uh, was also to consider the nuclear part of it. So uh, definitely, I mean, that that's uh, that's certainly something uh, to look at because but one of the advantages we can do is we can measure some of these matrix elements with safe cool X first. And then measure them again at a higher energy, uh, yeah, and right. then you can you can separate out the Coulomb part from the nuclear part. Maybe I can just uh, quickly comment. Ah, on yeah, good, yeah, good that you're here because this now thing is the person is actually doing this work. Yeah, and uh, it is uh, it, it is actually it was motivated in the beginning by Bob Professor Babaji. I wanted to say that, and uh, Vivek Dattar really knows him very well. Mm -hmm. That's why I think he's bringing up this. So this is actually motivated by uh, Babaji, CVK Babaji, uh, during my PhD. So I, I, I actually did this Coulomb nuclear interference one for my PhD work. And that's what is applied now in 96 Krypton, you know, for the, for the case where we have energies, uh, where we have contributions from nuclear form factor as well there. So we are doing that with Vivek actually. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Nursing, and uh, also Nigel. something else and chat. Okay. <clears throat> I think the discussion is <clears throat> thank you again, Nigel, for a very nice presentation. And now we go to Ken Kenzo Abrahams. Are you with us? I can see you. Yeah, yeah I am. Can you share screen with us? Can you share screen? 